to. Um, so I'm Nigel Hughes. I'm a scientific director based in the epidemiology group within uh, Janssen r and I'm based here in, uh, in Belgium. Um, but much of my uh, time and efforts are focused on uh, an innovative medicines initiative, IMI2 project called EDEN, European Health Data and Evidence Network, ehden.eu is the website. Um, but we're working to uh, very large scale data harmonization uh, using things like a common data model. Um, we're working with data partners and small to medium sized enterprises, SMEs, to achieve that uh, at scale across European member states. Create a federated network that's supportive of uh, open science research using uh, an analytical, standardized analytical um, pipeline of tools on top of the common data model. This is all based within Odyssey, OHDSI, Observational Health Data Science and Informatics. And then all the aspects related to research use cases, um, community generation development, education and obviously sustainability of that whole that whole uh, that whole network as it were going forward into into the future and and we work everything from you know basic drug utilization studies are envisaged right through to federated predictive analytics and all sorts of areas that go beyond my uh, my scope but uh, but certainly um that's uh, that's a major focus of, of where i'm working I think for me, a, a few things that stood out, I suppose, is, um, is, is the increasing ubiquity, if you like, or, or, or widespread spread of machine learning, AI uh, tools and concepts. Uh, I mean, one is in our society, but two also within, within healthcare. Um, some of it, it, I mean, it's, it's still emerging or nascent, but there are clearly you know, wide and, and broad uh, aspirations in terms of utilizing machine learning and artificial intelligence to assist whether it's uh, in you know, clinical decision-making, so kind of cognitive support to not necessarily replacing physicians and other healthcare workers, but aiding and augmenting the decisions that they do either on an individual patient uh, level or at a population level uh, in terms of you know, health management. Um, so so you know, we are in a situation right now, certainly in 2021, even, um, and certainly you know, still in the pandemic, unfortunately, um, that no one uh, clinician or equivalent healthcare worker can cope with the sheer mass of information that's being generated right now in, in, in terms of you know, research and so on. Um, and also that, there are, that you know, healthcare itself has become so much more complex in terms of managing disease and chronic diseases. And in fact, you know, a large body of people who are ill and in hospitals or community care usually have more than one thing wrong with them, more, one, more, more than one disease, you know, central disease and loads of comorbidities or so on. So it's a very complex uh, nature. Expectations are very high because of you know, uh, R&D and pharmaceutical and medical device and other interventions and so on and too. So there's a need to support uh, decision-making. And also um, how data is being generated and then potentially utilized for things like training sets and so forth uh, is, is, is really increasing quite widely. Uh, not just based on electronic health record data, but uh, you know where we generate, uh, we create data about the patient, not by the patient. But increasingly, there's a lot of data being generated by citizens and patients themselves, whether that's patient reported outcomes, for instance, or as we heard uh, from colleagues from Huawei and others, you know, from wearables uh, and uh, digital biomarkers and so forth. Um, so there's a there's a whole shift I think in terms of just the, the volume and variety and, and you know all the big data terms of veracity and everything else of, uh, of this type of data um, and also uh, beyond that um, that impacts I think on, 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 on how we will conduct analytical work um, right through to predictive work you know whether it's centralized whether it's in the cloud whether it's federated or edge computing and so on, you know, there's an increasing push for consideration of rather than sending the data from your watch, for instance, that eventually your watch will be able to compute uh, a lot of what's done centrally, for instance, or in the cloud locally um, and, and, and enabling, you know, a citizen or patient to make decisions based on you know, the trends and, and so forth, the data they're receiving from their, from their, from their sensors. Um, so so there's a, this is a really interesting time, I think, that point of view. And then lastly, I suppose, that comes to mind, and I should stop for breath, is, um, is that this is a socio-technical construct. You know, there are technological aspects to this. There are methodological aspects to this. 
but there are also socio aspects in terms of governance, things like privacy, security, confidentiality, you know, law and policy and so on, GDPR and Digital Governance Act here in Europe, uh, equivalent in, you know, with California now and other, other countries and nations obviously following suit. So, so we have to be mindful also that whatever is produced from a technical point of view also needs to be seen in a socio-technical construct that, that, that you know, is also um, per permissible and compliant with requirements to protect data and so on as well. Uh, yes, so some of it I'm working on tangentially. I'm, I'm not a data scientist. So I'm not necessarily working closely uh, hands-on with, with some of these projects, but there are a mixture of things. So, uh, so within the Eden project, which Janssen is, uh, is co-leading, um, we have worked on predictive analytics within relation to COVID-19, of course, within the pandemic. So with our Odyssey colleagues, who I mentioned earlier. Um, so we did a so-called study-a-thon, that shows the equivalent type would be a hackathon. <laughs> but uh, we did that in March, it's a four-day work, but you know, a lot of preceding work behind that and carrying on from there as well. Um, and, and actually that, that led to some of the collaboration with the French Health uh, Data Hub through the COVID-19 data partner call from Eden in April and May of last year. So some of the outputs there, for instance, were predictive work looking at, uh, can we predict which individuals who are then infected with sars cov 2 and develop COVID-19 need hospitalization? And more importantly, would need critical care, for instance. And so some predictive modeling uh, was, was conducted. And that's really important because of course that has clinical um, implications and clearly in decision making about what, what do I, who do I need to be worried about most in a hospital setting or when they come into hospital will eventually end up in critical care where we all know it's a massive challenge just in terms of capacity let alone in survival and then also uh, much of the work is also focused from an R&D perspective on you know who should we be monitoring and be concerned about in terms of potential need for treatment whether that's treatment with repurposed drugs or with new treatments that we bring out for SARS coronavirus 2. And we, Janssen, J, &J and, other, and others, you know, other companies, of course, uh, are all having uh, programs looking at potential, say, antivirals for SARS coronavirus 2. And of course, ultimately vaccines as well. You know, and uh, Janssen, Johnson Johnson, it's part of Johnson Johnson. Uh, we have a vaccines program too, like a number of other, other companies and collaborators as well. So, so understanding, characterizing, and then uh, phenotyping, but then also predicting uh, put the individuals most at risk is a real challenge here, I think, and that that's a, I think a real focus, which is probably topical because of the because of the pandemic. And I think what I was implying by this kind of voracious monster is that um, one of the things we know is uh, although the, you know it, it, it plateaus to a certain point, and you get you know there's an an area of work that's required to ensure. Um, confidence if you like in your in your algorithms um, for all sorts of factors but but certainly in terms of the the, the eventual outcome for that algorithm um, i'll give you a quick anecdote which i think i may have mentioned in the in the, in the uh, panel discussion if, if i didn't but if you look uh, i think about a year or more back um, apple brought out his first credit card um, and it worked with um, i think morgan stanley or someone but someone who actually a banking group who'd never produced a credit card which i found remarkable but anyhow what, what emerged from that was Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, uh, was, 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 in the, was in the media because it came to light that his credit balance, his credit limit, sorry, was much higher than his wife's. And it turned out that the algorithm had some inherent biases in terms of what credit limit it offered by gender. And women received a much lower limit than men. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, embarrassing, uh, it can be worked out, but if you, if you use the same analogy, but put it in a healthcare setting and you looked at something like uh, radiation dosing in cancer therapy, ultimately what could have happened is that male patients received considerably higher doses than they should have done, and women much lower doses than they should have done, which means you've harmed both by either adverse events or, or, lack, of, or lack, of, lack of efficacy of the, of the treatment. So the reason why I raised that is that, you know, we need to be very clear and transparent in, in, uh, in, in, in terms of AI and machine learning um, and, and what we're developing. And they need to be open to, be scrut to scrutiny. We clearly need to be um, very conscious of bias. Um, and therefore, you know, large representative and relevant data sets are critical. Uh, you know, 
initially for the training sets, but then beyond that too. So that's really, really very important. Um, and there are ways to work with this. You don't necessarily have to work in a centralized manner. So, you know, you mentioned, I think, hosting and, 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 and so forth, you know, and, and yes, there's been some some stuff in the last few years about you know we're kind of running out of space for all the data not just in this this respect but just generally that we're creating now as a society um but uh, and of course it's incredibly expensive and it's not pretty great for the environment either but actually i think understanding how we can work in more uh federated and networked ways so data doesn't have to be necessarily aggregated. It can stay where it is, but you can do you know, local work and then aggregate the results and so forth. I think it's one way of looking going forward. But whatever you do, depending on the nature of your work with an algorithm, you know, an artificial intelligence and what you're, what you're aiming to achieve there, um, you ultimately leave it. You will, you will need quite large data sets and they need to be very representative and very relevant. And so they, they don't necessarily need to be also large, but also deep and broad. Again, in terms of in terms of the uh, in terms of the, the individuals captured, so different gender, different race, you know, all sorts of aspects. Um, that I think inherently at the moment, I think is more of the issue personally. This this is a really good question, Matu. And I think first and for, foremost, and actually, uh, we've been discussing it in, in recent meetings in the last few days uh, with with the OECD. Um, there was a great point made, which I would definitely confer, that we need to demystify healthcare for technologists. If you don't have a healthcare background, but you move into this space with your data science background, for instance, or whatever, you know, you know, you bring a lot, obviously, with you in terms of skills and knowledge and so on. But that clearly needs to be embedded in 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 the clinical context. So actually, if maybe not difficult today, but but certainly in the future and post pandemic. Even spending time, uh, uh, if you can, within your local hospital, or if you have a clinician friend or someone you can spend time with and shadow, um, is time well spent. You need to understand how healthcare works because there are an awful lot of assumptions about how healthcare works, and they don't always they don't always match up to to the aspirations. And also, if you're introducing, I don't know, say another new additional diagnostic bioinformatic tool, for instance, just as an example, it needs to work within the clinical workflow, i.e. how clinicians in general healthcare workers work around treating, you know, say a type two diabetes patient or someone with a type of cancer. There are, there are kind of a workflow that people follow um, and the most successful systems, whether it's electronic health records or new tools, whether they're machine learning or otherwise, are more successful when they understand the workflow. If you don't understand the clinical workflow, you're more likely to make assumptions, which are, shall we say, not so user friendly. Um, and then really critically important, it needs to be transparent. It can't be a black box. Uh, partly because you need maybe regulatory approval for, for what you could create in the future. You know, it needs to be regulated and approved for use clinically, but also clinicians will need to understand how did you get from uh, the initial supposition, uh, hypothesis for instance, through the algorithm to this decision or this suggestion or this recommendation for instance within the tool. Um, I need, maybe I'm not a day scientist, you know, I'm a clinician, but at least have to have some insight and understanding of how that works. And partly I need to know for myself to have confidence in the, in the recommendation the results. I may need to explain this to others, inclusive of the patient, <laughs> um, and, and so on. So there's a whole aspect, I think, of embedding what you do in demystifying healthcare as a technologist or a data scientist and so forth, and then recognizing that that may impact on what you design and or you develop or how it's implemented. And importantly, then how the recommendations or the outputs of that algorithm and so forth are accepted, uh, whether it's regulatory or whether it's for the clinician or whether it's someone, you know, purchasing that in the future or whatever yeah yeah I hope so Mateo no thank you so much for the invitation and also just to say um an excellent initiative the AI for Health Health School I think uh, an excellent initiative there are now too few of these I think as far as I'm aware um so so I think anyone that was able to take the opportunity to participate was very fortunate because uh, I, I think it was an excellent program but actually you know we need more of this, more and more of this, uh, definitely. So, so congratulations to you all as well.